I don't know if I have sound anymore. That's really jarring. Can't seem to like. All right. Have sound. Whew. All right. So we're back. You know me. So when we last left off, this shit didn't make sense. Arcat, Dave, are you there? I'm in Dave. This car cat over. Answer me, you jack off. Don't be like all the Don't be all like you're too busy to pick up. Who are you trying to kid? You are quite possibly the only person on this meteor who's got even less on his nutrition plateau than me. Really? Even the mayor has a more demanding schedule than we do. Let's fucking face let's face the fucking facts. What, did you think Cantown runs itself? Fat chance, Dave. God damn it, Dave, I have a problem. No, we have a problem. Gaia is now visible to the naked eye. We can't be much more than a few hours away. This is it. This is what we've been waiting for. Three of the longest human we'll ever have to live for the rest of our lives sunk into this depression or this pressing laboratory which by all accounts should have never functioned as anything but our eternal tomb i have no idea how we're even supposed to stop this too. oh well sending it blasting off somewhere at the speed of light sure seemed like a good idea at the time and now that we're finally here with all the waiting and drama and boredom and stupid bullshit with our ancestral ghosts, even disregarding the one hilariously neglected detail that the meteor has no fucking breaks. I still don't think we're ready for this. Bye. I don't. How do I even begin to address this? Shit? Okay, how about this? Since we, can, I can't think of a better general purpose question to help break the ice and. Any in literal any ima what break the ice in literally any imaginable social situation. Oh, where are your fucking pants? My pants. What are you talking about? They're on my legs. I wasn't talking to you. Oh, Dave, we have a big problem here. What? I think it's time we had a, what did you call it? An intervention. For Rose? No, not Rose. Why would I be talking about Rose? She doesn't, she doesn't have a major problem that needs to be confronted about by her friends before she flushes her whole life down the scamper, does she? Uh, yeah, kind of. Why? Because she likes to drink that goofy human soporific that makes her a lot funnier and more charming than usual? How is that a problem? I'm talking about Terezi. Man, Terezi doesn't need an intervention. She just drinks a lot of soda. How can you not see how that is a huge fucking problem? It's red fizzy shit water, dude. Who cares? Okay. Can we just once acknowledge that we are mutual aliens to each other? And as such, possibly have different values and standards about things. Just this one time, Dave. Thanks. Trezzy has made her choices. Almost <laughs> among them was to begin guzzling untold liters of what putrid circus of that putrid co circus cola. Think of it as like a rite of passage, something that just goes with the territory when someone you know almost imperceptibly begins turning into a juggalo. Wait, fuck. Maybe she does need an intervention. Needs to wake up so we can talk to her about this. She won't wake up. What do I do? Did you try kicking her? Yes. I'm out of ideas. <laughs> well, whenever she wakes up, we all need to have a serious talk about this. If she's in this condition when we get to the new session, it'll be a goddamn embarrassment. Not to mention deadly. Need I remind you who's still following us? She doesn't look primed for battle where I'm from where I'm standing. 
to act like a unified front, Dave. We need to let her know that <laughs> as her friends, we can't stand by and watch her degrade herself like this. Man, I don't know. Sounds like you want to make this needlessly melodramatic. Stand by, I'm putting you on speaker crab. Speaker crab? Yes, speaker crab. Man, don't put me on speaker crab. She needs to hear from you, Dave. She trusts you. God, honestly, she can do whatever she wants. I put this all behind me a while ago. Why do you really want me in this conversation? Is it just so... It's just, just that you don't know what to say yourself? Maybe it is, Dave. Maybe that ex that's exactly what it fucking is. I'm sorry, I'm not a god tier. I'm not so fortunate as to be blessed with the gift of gab like you. What? That badge you earned, you know? That one that <laughs> makes it easier to talk to people? Like, really open up about your feelings and say whatever needs to be said? Yeah, isn't that what you think that does? Isn't it? No, dude, that's not what Gift of Gab does. Okay, what does it do then, wise guy? Its utility isn't really comprehensible to lowly mortals, sorry. Snide shoot, 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 Huffer. Why don't you come up here so I can push you off this building? Nah, I'm putting you on speaker crab, and then together we are going to keep it real as shit. Do you hear me? What do you actually want from her? You want her to stop drinking Fago and falling asleep in puddles of red fructose corn slobber? Or do you want her to somehow address the root of these habits and cut all that out for good? Yes, I want her to do that, the latter thing. Yeah, I can understand where you're coming from, but in situations like this, I remind yourself, there's only so much you can do for some, And maybe they aren't going to want to or need your help just have to figure out how to deal with that. Like at some point in your life, one of your friends might start spending all her time with a guy you think is bad news. And you have to decide if you need to intervene as a friend or just let it go because people can change or drift apart or whatever because that's just something that happens. Dave, your wisdom, my God, it's knocking my socks off. Holy shit, please tell me the secret to your wise ways. And while you're at it, maybe you could tell me what the fuck you're talking about. Look, all I'm saying is, there comes a time when you need a certain call. In every young woman's life, when she has to come to terms with the decision to gradually morph into a juggalo while all her friends and loved ones watch in dismay, Terezi has strolled through the dark carnival and taken a great brooding whiff of that delicious festive asshole. And the choice she's made is all too clear. He's down with the clown. No, don't say that. It's true, man. I live in denial for only so long, but as your bro, I have to say, I have to say it like it is. In Gamzy, man, it, that is literally a thing. They are in the hate square together. Total kiss me spades, dude. No, that's not what I mean. I mean, I know that. Just why do you have to put everything so colorfully? I guess I do the same thing, but you always seem to take things to a different level of gross. Just please, say shit normally for a change, okay? Regarding Gamzy, yeah, I knew about that already. Oh, really? Then what the fuck have I been tiptoeing around all this time, goddamn? I thought this was supposed to be like this big secret that would destroy you if you found out. Motherfucker, please, do you think I'm an idiot? I've suspected this was going on for a long time. I was just being like you, playing it cool, letting her do whatever. Then why is it a problem now? Because this is the last straw, we're supposed to be ready for action by now, not comatose, half-naked, and fago stick. God, I wonder what sort of bullshit he's got her believing in. About the mirthful messiahs and Shangri-La and all that garbage. It makes me so sad to think she's caught up in his superstition, superstitious web of lies. It's been awful watching the person I used to know slowly drift away from me, to the point where she might as well be gone. How did you manage to deal with that? But you and she used to see each other all the time. What happened? Like I said, I just put it behind me. We started sneaking around in vents and stuff, acting suspicious, trying to hide the fact that she was like she was obviously ashamed of it and worried how I'd react. But it was hella transparent that was going. On. So I just said, "That's fine. Y'all can do your black rom thing with the juggalo. It's your decision." But I can't keep playing along. I can't do the quadrant thing. It's just too weird for me. I'm not a troll and I'm not all open-minded about getting multicultural. 
I still don't understand the spades thing, and it makes me really fucking uncomfortable even trying to imagine how that works. And I sure as fuck don't want to date somebody who's got a hate clown on the side. So I said, so I said, no hard feelings. I still like you and all. Do whatever makes you happy. I'll just be over here in the hypergravity chamber training to beat Lord English. You have a hypergravity chamber? No. Oh. But what about you? Haven't you been talking to Gamzee this whole time, or is he just balls out lying to you about sneaking around the meteor with Trezzy? I thought Moirels were supposed to be open with each other. Yeah, uh, Gamzee ended our more alliance quite some time ago. Oh shit, sorry to hear about that. Fine, it was really a dead-end, dead-end pale relationship. At first, it really seemed like I was a necessary part of his life, keeping it under control. But as time went on, he just got completely disinterested and kept... I wasn't keeping up with his end of the thing at all. He started getting so unbelievably self-satisfied and pious. Like, way more than he ever was before. Like, he's just so completely convinced he found his calling. And that this session is the gateway to the promised land where he'll fulfill his destiny. He's so caught up in his idiotic scheme, he couldn't give a fuck about me anymore. Whatever, at least he stopped killing people. Amazing. I spent three years on this rock and never said one thing to the guy. I saw him once, though. A glimpse in a dark hallway. It was kind of like seeing a blurry purple Bigfoot with a huge boner. Oh god, that fucking god tier outfit. What a goddamn faker. I can't for the life of me imagine where he got that. I know Kanaya, sure. His hell didn't make it for him. The man literally has no shame. Why is he wearing it? I don't know. I don't think even he knows. Maybe to make a good impression on his fake-ass religious idol, after he thrusts his sacred codpiece through the gates of Shangri-La. Huh. Best thing we ever do together is slam this asshole's damn dumb religion. Yeah. Really, it's the most hilarious fucking horse shit I've ever heard. I mean, pretty much all religions are wrong, but there's wrong and then there's wrong. As in zero chance you are ever proven right about a single thing. Dude, ever, ever, ever. Ha! <laughs> so true. I wish I could see the look on his face when he finally realizes everything he believes is. Be one sad clown that day. Bulge will probably deflate and make his high pitched noise plus. make this high pitched noise plus corresponding flatulence. Hey, Dave. What do you think will happen to us after we meet with the others? I mean, as friends. What do you mean as friends? I mean, will we still get to be bros? Uh, yeah, no offense, dog. But that's a dumb, neurotic question. No, but see, we're going to meet all these other people. Join John among them. And John is your best friend. So you will off ostensibly resume that friendship where you left off. And John and I had a few trusty conversations with each other once. And in most of those, I made a fool of myself. I guess we became friends that day, maybe? But the reality is that it was just one day. And he'd be, well, within a reasonable frame of mind. He'd be well within a free reasonable frame of mind to not give a crap in hindsight about the guy who trolled him once three years ago. And the same goes for Jade. I thought we had a decent rapport. But again, it was one day forever ago. Probably barely remembers me at this point. Whereas that doesn't matter for you, because you go way back with me. This is like a fucking heartfelt reunion for you. But where does that leave me? I can hardly call Gamzee your friend anymore. Who knows if my friendship with Terezi will ever be what it, that, what it was before. I used to be pretty close with Kanye, but now she and Rose never leave each other alone more than a fucking minute. All my other friends are dead. Now we're leaving the dream bubbles behind. And then there's you. So, I'm just wondering what happens next. Forgot the mayor. Pretty tight with the mayor, aren't you? The mayor's friendship is a universal constant, and I am insulted beyond comprehension as well as my capacity to vomit that you would insinuate otherwise. Yeah, the mayor rules. But as usual, you are overcomplicating this. Just like you overcomplicate everything. Friendship, leadership, romance, shipping grids, dick battles. This is real simple. Our meteor will somehow Tokyo drift to a dead stop in the new session. 
at which point we will keep bros for life or something. I'll start being friends with John and Jade again because they are my friends and never stopped being that. John will also be your friend because he's cool and also a doofus who's easy to be friends with. Jade will be your friend too because she's nice and likes being friends with people. I can personally guarantee that she will be happy to see you. And as for the new people, I don't know about them, but they'll probably be your friends too. All I know is two of them are my parents and two of them are John's parents. And ain't no rule that says you can't be friends with your bro's mom and pop. Especially when your bro's mom and pop are a couple of sassy teens. As for Terezi, I don't know, I guess we'll see what happens. And as for Gamzee, fuck that guy with a balloon poodle. Friendship lessons secured the end. Uh oh, look who's starting to come around. Honk. Wake up, sleepyhead. Honk, honk, yeah, that's right. It's time to face the fucking music. Hey, you, computer man. I need more help. No, computer man, assist. Computer man, ah, computer man, assist me with more hot tips. No. Yes, I'm having trouble understanding Blue Hat. This is a shameful exploitation of our arrangement. We aren't supposed to talk anymore once you rent left the Earth. I did not agree to those terms. Every time we talk, you complain that I am being self-indulgent. But you always come back for more. It's like you can't get enough of me. I think you might be obsessed. Give me more hot tips, asshole. You only made that cow top so you could talk to me on the go, didn't you? No. Please don't lie. Who else would you use it to talk to in your solo session? Gamzy? I bet you haven't said one word to him through that day. You never even refer to him by his name. The clown has been an adequate peon when it comes to doing things I don't want to do. There is no reason to speak to him through my pun helmet. Try to be better friends with him. He basically ditched his best buddy for you. Who cares? He reveres you and you treat him like shit. Yes, yeah, so? So, you're off to a pretty good start at being a god, I guess. Thank you. Oh, who's calling me? Phone and... Oh, let's see this. One moment, please. Oh, wait. I guess that just ended. Sure. I'm gonna move to my cell phone now. Oh, yeah, because my phone's dead. Ah, that explains a lot. I didn't turn my phone. Well then, and who? Oh, he reveres you, and you treat him like yes, shit. You're off to a pretty good start at being a god, I guess. Thank you. Look, I just said a polite thing. Now reward me with what I want. Uh, yellow hat is very fast. As a minion, he has been very useful. But I am having trouble determining the abilities of blue hat. Yellow hat and blue hat? You should come up with better names for them. Like what? I don't know. Maybe some cool mobster names. Mobster? Oh, that, those doofuses. They look like fucking leprechauns. Oh, if I miss something, blah, blah, blah. Because mobster, yeah, mobster names. Why would I give them mobster names? Because mobsters are cool. They don't look like mobsters. They look like fucking leprechauns. Anyone can be a mobster, though. Even cherubs and leprechauns. Being a mobster isn't about what you look like. It's about what's inside you. Aw. Real mob Pia was the friends we made along the way. <laughs> wow, that... Is so profound. Now stop stalling and give me tips. Are these the only two you've unlocked so far? Yes. I've conquered the second planet and now and have now traveled to the third.
Before I conquer this one, I would like to know what Blue Hat does. He's pretty much doing what he does. <laughs> he seems to be stuck. Is he broken? No, he's just slow. Oh my god. What? That's his power. Yellow hat is fat, fast. Blue hat is slow. How is that even a power? It just is. Dark. I was looking forward to achieving new, more powerful minions. Not more malingering fools to take up space in my dark carnival. Can they get better than this? That depends on what you mean by better. Oh my god. We're so done. Bye. And hell, I actually wake up, sleepy head. Wait, why did I even say that? Stay asleep all you want, like I give a fuck. There. Uh, oh god, I forgot. Noise gate is weird. I don't know how much of like my comments are even being dropped. But... Yeah, stay asleep all you want. Like, I give a fuck. Uh... But you are kind of missing some important shit here. We spend three days, three faux relative, faux relative, relativistic years cruising through the metaphysical ass crack of nowhere. And when we finally get here, you're all tuckered out. Like, y'all didn't sleep enough on this boat already. Excuse me. Some of the sick, nastiest shut-eyes anyone ever got. I owe to this friggin' boat. Dude, this is a big deal. Everyone's waiting for us there. I mean, probably. I don't know where we are. Some green, hilly place with all these stone hinges sprinkled around. Did you know there could be a plurality of stone henges? I didn't, but guess what fucking what? Henges aplenty. Where's this place? Where this place is concerned. Hey, where's Jade? I guess she left already. Maybe there was an emergency somewhere and her doggy senses led her there. Maybe someone fell down a well. What do you think, John? Do you think our teen parents fell down a well? I sincerely doubt that any of them would be that pathetic. Whatever it was, <laughs> whatever it was, must have been important enough for Jade to ditch us. Like either that, or maybe she was that desperate to finally get away from me. Between you and me, John, I re didn't really handle things with her as well as I could have. Oh well, maybe real Dave will treat her better, or not. I don't know. I did her a favor, cutting Bird Dave out of her life. Nobody really deserves Bird Dave as a boyfriend or a friend. Or anything. It's like getting one of those janky Daves from the bargain from the bargain bin at the Dave Depot. Or one of those markdown Daves the day after National Dave Day. It's like somebody taxidermized your Dave and expected you not to notice. Feathers Feathers, what feathers? Haha, <laughs> that is no, that Dave is totally normal and okay. You should just go to being bros with, or go back to being bros with real Dave when you see him. I'll be fine. I'll just flap around and do my thing alone. I'm completely right with that at this point. We had our ups and downs, John, but all in all, it was cool to go on this road trip with you. There were some, t there were some times, man. The times, I'm telling you, they were unreal. I bet you people would pay good money to see every second of the madcap stunts that were going on in this ship basically 24-7. F hulls could talk. Ah, just joking. It was seriously boring as hell. But, I mean, it was still cool, so yeah, hey, what, what's that ring anyway? I've seen you with that ring before. And I guess it was just like, okay, John has a magic ring for some reason. No need to mention that or anything, but where did you even get it? You can't even hear me. You got your snooze on so hard. Ain't gonna wake you up to hassle you about no ring. I probably should have said all this stuff when you were awake anyway. 
Like the stuff about friendship. Fuck it. I'll just leave another one of my patented magic notes take to your or your cowlick or something. My magic notes rule. I'll miss leaving them taped on stuff. I sure do talk to myself a lot, don't I? Wow, why have I never made this observation? I probably needed to be a bird for exactly three years to finally have that epiphany. I wonder if real Dave ever had that epiphany. Probably not, because he's not a bird. Bottom line is, being a guy who's also a bird makes you think. Anyway, I'm out. Yes, happy birthday, John. Have some watermarks for the road. Huh? Or Dave's. Oh boy, he's unlocked more peeps. I unlocked more peeps. <laughs> more gnomes. I thought they were leprechauns. I don't care what they are. Okay. I've now conquered four planets and have the same amount of gnomes under my command. Yellow hat, blue hat, red hat, and purple hat. Congratulations. The planets are becoming increasingly difficult to conquer. I almost did not manage to destroy the purple planet within the allotted time. Unfortunately, the quality of the unlocked gnomes has not increased to match the escalating difficulty of my quest. It seems to be just the opposite. These gnomes are shit. What's wrong with the gnomes? Okay, Red Hat. He has no fucking powers at all. Unless his power is to follow me around constantly. Yeah, that's basically what he does. Purple Hat is even worse. Is his power to dance around all the time while singing riddles to me? Yep. Awful. Purple Hat's behavior is so infuriating, I've attempted to murder him several times, but to no avail. Can't kill Purple Hat. He's too lucky. That's also his power, being really lucky. What good does that do me? I don't know. Get him to solve puzzles for you? Use him as a human shield sometime? I mean, a gnome shield? Oh yeah, that's actually a really good idea. You shouldn't be whining about how lame your minions are. As you accumulate more, your job is to obviously combine their talents in creative ways to overcome the increasingly difficult talents and design your quest. Synergize your time gnomes. Make them more than the sum of their pointy hats. That's going to be difficult. They're all idiots. Nobody said it would be easy. Fine, I have no more questions for now. Hey, did you kill that cute little turtle? No, but I can see your past trail. You're standing there holding a gun, pointing it at the turtle. Okay, then yes, I killed the turtle. Uh... Oh, hey, past trail. Fuck that turtle up. Fucking up reality. Hey, it's the blue boy again. See him there? Just off the starboard shit. Yo, watch how far away I can fork him from. Mina, put the trident down. Don't make me confiscate it again. Confiscate. Hey, it's John. Riska, is that you? Yeah, get over here. All right. Oh, great. Nice to see you again, John. It's been too long. Yeah, actually, hasn't it been exactly a year? I think it was my birthday last time we met, too. Huh. Here for you, maybe. Who knows how long it has been out here, but who cares? Point is, as you can see, the plan I described to you before is in full swing. You mean the big treasure hunt with all those black maps? Yes, but they aren't black anymore. Not totally. Everything's gone exactly as I intended. English has taken the bait. Hook, line, and sinker. We've been clearing, chasing our extended party around the ring, blowing shit up with his monster breath, thus revealing the path to the treasure in the process. I must say, for an evil mastermind, the guy is kind of a dope. Supposedly, his every move is a carefully calculated ploy to assure his existence in the first place. Here he is wrecking the. Or an oaf. 
unwittingly helping the hero find the weapon that will finally take him down. And we're almost there too, although by now it's become obvious that the treasure was hidden right around where we started all along. These maps have just been leading us in a big stupid. I should have seen it coming. I guess that's my bad. In terms of boneheaded moves, that's English one, Vriska one. That's Reeve. But maybe we don't have to mention that detail when we document my heroism in the annals of greatness. Uh, mention what exactly? Exactly. Haha, <laughs> I almost forgot how deceptively quick you are on the uptake, John. That's not impressive. I was confused by what you were saying, too. Tavros, if you interrupt, don't mumble. And even then, don't. Oh, hold on. Anyway, I really don't mind the fact that these cryptic treasure maps have led us all on a wild hook, hook bird chase, or honk bird chase. I've never once complained about a good long treasure hunt, and I'm not about to start now. Besides, with the way space-time works out, they, who can say for sure we would be able to find the treasure at all, unless we trace this exact path? Nobody can say that, is least of all English, who, as far as I know, can't exactly speak so much as it. Blood-curdling roars that cleave the foundations of reality itself. You're of course welcome to join us on our adventure, for as long as you're asleep. You could use another hand on deck. I'll even give you a rank and title. You get to be lower than me. That's the fairest rule. Wrong. Tavros, who's the captain here? Last time I checked, it wasn't... It wasn't swabby. Put Master short in here. By the way, how Tav hi Tavros, how have you been? Okay, cool pirate outfit. No, thanks, but it's not cool. Um, Riskum wants me to wear it though. I do. Be happy. Don't ask me where my pants are. I wasn't going to. We all look amazing as pirates. This is non-negotiable. No arguments here. What about the rest of your crew? I remember her. The punky one who always likes to stab me with her spear. But I really hope she doesn't do that this time. Dream on, blue nerd. You're in my crosshair. You in my crosshair, sucker. Got you right where I want. Just biding my time. Biding and biding. Gonna hunt you till we both double dead. You are my obsession, little bluefish. My shrimpiest of whales. My mobiest of dicks. Call me fish male. That's a good one. That's a real good one. Stop it. But I don't know the one who looks kind of like your sister. What is your name? Arnea. Hi. What about those two over there? These are my friends, Aradia and Solix. I recruited them for this expedition. They aren't really here to do any fighting, but their abilities will become useful once we... Hello. Hey, are you alive? Your eyes do not look spooky or ghostly. Thanks, yes, I'm alive. Yeah, and apparently she tends to stay that way. Hence her principled, if somewhat lame, commitment to pacifism. But considering our history together, I'm willing to let bygones be bygones. I'm happy to have her on my crew in whatever capacity she your history? What happened? Wait, that's a rude question. Riska killed her too. She used the other guy there tragically as the death. Hey, what did I say about bygones being bygones? It's like rule fucking one of this ship. Anyway, she became a robot and killed me back, so obviously we're cool now. Because why does everyone die so much? Well, like this guy's one to talk. Solix, don't make our guests uncomfortable. He's already uncomfortable, and he should be. We all should be. Really, I haven't thought about any of that in a long time. Conflicts don't mean anything to me. But I was more than thrilled by the opportunity to go on another adventure like this. We used to enjoy such campaigns together all the time when we were younger. 
Of course, now the teams are a little different. Yeah, man, those were the days. What about you? Why do you have double eye patches? Uh, because I'm blind, stupid. I can't tell if you're alive too or not because your eyes are spooky. They're spooky as shit, but yes, I'm alive. Okay, here's the short version. I was able to see, but then I went blind. Then I used my powers too hard and died. But it turns out I was only half dead. Let me finish. So the ghost half of me could see again, so I was only half blind. But all, but then somebody prototyped my corpse, which I guess sucked the ghost half out of me, or ghost half of me out of my body, to make me fully alive again, also fully blind. And now the ghost part of my soul is sharing a sprite, a sprite body with fucking Aridin of all. Who's Aridin? Just the douche who blinded me in the first place. It doesn't even matter. Um, alright. But I don't think I quite followed all of that. What does being half dead mean? You know, forget it. I'm so sick of telling this story to people over and over again, and nobody understanding what the hell I'm talking about. It's all so simple. No, actually it isn't. It's a fucking stupid story that makes no sense. Maybe that's the problem. My marginal existence is fraught with so much pointless duality and complicated nonsense, so I'm done with even trying to explain. Now on, I should just wear a shirt that says, Don't ask me about my disability or my mortality. And then everything would be fine. It's really kind of a shame Gamzee prototyped Aridin's torso parts and swiped his ghost form from the afterlife. I bet he would have had a great time on this voyage. I used to own him during our nautical campaigns all the time. If he was on this ship, I'd walk the plank and plummet through the fake-ass water through nowhere forever. Besides, you act like you haven't already recruited at least 50 fucking Aridans from Dune timelines in your army. You really are shamefully prejudiced against our alternative reality ghost selves. They are just as real as we are, and have the same emotions and everything. Give me a break, Solex, as if you don't view them the exact same way. You've got real Aridan, then pretty much a whole bunch of pretenders out there. They're all real. Shit, I don't even like Aridan, but here I am sticking up for his copies. See, you just called them copies. Even you can't avoid accidentally using a problematic slur, which reveals that no matter what you believe about your morals, deep down you're always going to favor the original, while viewing all others as duplicates of lesser value. Oh, whatever. Just whatever. Rationalize the collateral damage to your army all you want. And to think, before I joined your party, I heard rumors that you might have changed. To learn, like, learn to be a better person or something. Heh, <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, please, I hardly think that I'm a bad person for failing to give a shit about a billion meaningless dead Nepitas. Do you? No, you're not a bad person for that particular reason, I guess. What am I supposed to do, fly around and befriend each one individually? Sorry, I have better things to do with my... Let's try to be at least somewhat practical. I've met most of those Nepitas. <laughs> They're all very nice. Oh, shut up. And what about all those ships ahead? Are they part of the treasure hunt too? Of course, that's my army. Off. Okay, I mean our army, but like on boats. Isn't an army on boats usually called a navy? John, help me out. I seem to be having trouble remembering which one of us is the captain. <laughs> was it the dork in blue pajamas, or was it the veteran sailor in the rad captain's coat? That's right, the captain was me. And I'd say it's an army that happens to be a bunch of... <laughs> I say that it's an army that happens to be on a bunch of boats. Oh, oh damn, he got smoked. Wow, so did you get those six fires? No, but for real, it pretty much is a baby. Just saying. <sighs> who's in an army? Or who's in the army? Thousands of ghosts, primarily those of old friends and acquaintances. We have a massive collection of volunteer volunteers ready to lay down their ghost lives for a worthy cause. I mean, fighting Lord English? When we're ready for that, yes, but we need the treasure first. Now they're all sailing well ahead of us in large numbers to attract his attention. We can do more damage around the ring and fill out the rest of our maps. We should be very grateful for their bravery. 
They are all making. They are making a noble sacrifice for us all. Bravery. Yeah, right. I'm pr mostly sure she's mind controlling them. God damn it, Tavros. We really don't need your play-by-play -play commentary on everything. Wait, you're mind controlling all these ghosts? No. Well, not all of them. Once you group enough together, others tend to latch out to them. <laughs> To the mob out of curiosity. We trolls have our way of clustering together naturally. You gotta understand, John, most of these people are pretty self absorbed. They just needed a little bit of persuasion to join the cause. Word. Yeah, but isn't that still kind of um, dickish? But all these stubborn jackasses are going to double die anyway if we don't all work together and kill this guy. This is war, John. In times of war, difficult decisions have to be made with the lives of many. Just think of me as a general giving orders to my troops. It just happens that the orders are a little more direct in this case. Hey, Circuit, Deuce. Let's not lose track of who's actually in charge of this, okay? Yeah, yeah, I'll hail her imperious team condescension, fresh new face of tyranny. Supreme Admiral Pike. This time, I would like to motion for a 15-minute bowing <laughs> so that we may demonstrate our reverence for this bold, spunky lady. Yes. Davro, stop bowing. That was a joke. No, keep doing that. Lower, Swabby. Lower. Face on the fucking deck. Yes. Just like that. Perfect. How do you mind control so many ghosts at once? Isn't that kind of hard? Well, I do have a little help. John, did I mention Ancestor? Best. He is? I must admit, I was not in favor of the idea at first, but Briska made a very strong case for using powers in this. In a perfect reality, no one would have to get hurt, but the stakes are too high to be sure. You know what I mean? The best. It has been wonderful spending time on this adventure. Not just because it's helped me get to know her better, but because it's opened my eyes to think about myself. There are certain capabilities within me I've never quite been able to face. It's helped me realize that I've been hiding from them. It must be true what they say, <laughs> what they used to say on my world, that you really want to know who you are. Just look to the legacy left behind by you. I think. That wisdom works in both directions. Well put, Mark. I've always felt the exact same way. Duke. Oh my god, the Cirque Twins being a door bubble again. Hey, Tram, get your mop ready for swabbing up all this vomit coming out of my mouth. Oh no. Can you two stick a fork in the sedimental carp? Maybe pretend you ain't hit it off so good. You ever stop and think how this makes me feel? No reason to be jealous, Mina. You know nothing has changed about our friends. Jealous, bitch. No. This makes me think about my kid to say how instead of having this cool, frenzy relation with her, I just got this uncontrollable urge to stab her to death so she can threaten my supremacy. Which is a shame, because she's so cute. God damn my royal blood and the cray junk it makes. Oh well, maybe someday I'll find a Harris who my genes don't instinctively make me want to murder on sight. Then I can teach her the badass ways of being a boss and shit. Those are so weird. John just said trolls are weird. He said it quietly, but I heard him. Hey, you snitch. Yeah, but aren't we? Uh, moral of the story is Blue Kid is a dumb nerd, but he's right when he says stuff. Look at that. Like me are becoming fast friends, thus lulling him into a sense of pity. What? It's in my little. It is true to a human, the ways of trolls from both Alternia and before us will seem very strange. In fact, prior to uniting in the afterlife, the two trolls were reasonably alien to each other. I've had a great deal of time to study the culture about paradox space. No matter which race you belong to, 
one can always find another who's a Bill's poet attention the most and though the ethical standards of those from Alternia may seem palatable to you, rest assured that though there are beings elsewhere as most violent beings extreme even to most troll. Actually, John, I'm very glad you brought this up, because I was in the middle of a wonderful story about this very subject. Interrupted when you boarded our ship. Oh, sorry. No, that's fine, really. I'm quite pleased that you did. This way I get to start over from the thing. Prime says it for me. There were some rough patches in my original telling, which I can go back and fix. This time it will be much better. Okay, what's the story about? A very mysterious alien race called Parrots. Let us begin. Upon a time. Building. There was a very mysterious alien. Hey, I thought you said you would fix the shitty parts of the story. You started with that crap line first time too. The opening line. All right, I guess. Uh, oh, shut up and let me tell my story. Now, where was I? Oh, fuck that. That story. There was a very mysterious alien race called Cherry. Right? There was a very mysterious alien race called Cherub. But there was one Cherub in particular for who at least the first half of our story will be our. She spent eons roaming her galaxy completely alone, but the time had come for her to find a mate. This is no small task for a cherub. Being an asocial species, virtually no time in each other's presence at all. Aside from when it is time, they go may go their entire lives without encounter. So they scatter their numbers across their numbers throughout space, each taking a territory spanning light years. But like a predator is able to track the scent of its prey, a cherub can sense the presence of another nearby. This sense is especially strong if that cherub shares the same qualities as the other half. Its other half, what? Its other half wants to go. Before it experienced the maturation process. You see, when a young cherub hatches, it will appear that only one creature has begun its life. The young cherub actually male and female, each sharing one body. Two halves are endowed with polar opposite one predisposed towards malevolence, good or evil, if you prefer to deal in simplistic or at least those which are convenient. I prefer to view the dichotomy as kind of a moral alignment, like an attribute that dictates the choices a character makes. Oh god, I don't know how much is kind of bothering me. Oh god, I have to fix that, wow. Uh So I, uh, yeah, okay, let's hope to God that this doesn't do. Oh, no. Okay. Uh... Blah, blah, blah. Da, 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 where was I? Do, 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 do. Oh, yeah. 
Male and female halves can be aligned either way as long as they differ from each other. The resulting conflict between the two personalities is central to life as a cherub, both before and after predomination. Essentially, or shortly after hatching, the two halves begin facilitating, taking turns controlling the body. The only physical differ differentiation, differentiation between the two is the coloration of their cheek swirls, which indicates alignment. There is otherwise no way to tell male and female apart, for a cherub predominates. The facilitation process is, oh my god, is demarcated by sleep. When the male goes to sleep, the female wakes up. And when the male wakes up, again the female sleeps. And so it goes back and forth like this as the two identities vie for dominance over the other. And ultimately, permanent control over the body. They grow to detest one another and develop a view of social interaction centered entirely around animosity and confrontation. For good cherubs, this readies them for a life of isolation, as they will prefer to avoid the sort of conflict that comes with social interaction as they have been conditioned to understand it. But for evil ones, the contentious upbringing only serves to fuel their inclination to harm others. And though this duality makes for a tormented childhood, the inner conflict it creates is very important for, or is an extremely important part of a young cherub's life. The defining part, actually, it is the struggle a cherub must overcome to mature. And this process culminates in predomination. One half will prove to be. Oh, one will have to prove a stronger will than the other. The less dominant half will then weaken over time and it will eventually become clear to both that one will not survive. The dominant personality will then completely consume the other, integrating it in such a way that only one is left. The cheeks will become solidly colored, and the cherub will grow to mature as a single being, endowed with the alignment of the dominant half, and with all his or her personal qualities at the forefront of the union. In the case of our heroine, she was the good half, and the day her pro and the day of her predomination was in a sense the day her brother died. And all and though it was to her benefit and personal growth, because of this loss she would always live with a sense that something was missing. Every sexually mature cherub lives with this feeling. It drives them to seek out another cherub similar to the half they lost the part of their being which they grew up in perpetual conflict with, the desire to travel the universe in hopes of reigniting that conflict is very important to their species. It is the force which compels them to procreate. So she set out to track his scent, as it were, and soon she found a physical trail as well, as a, a path of carnage left behind by a particularly destructive male cherub. Oh. She followed the debris from civilized worlds and star systems he left behind, as if to mock her, to make it clear he knew her pursuit and was all but paving her way with the dead. His brutality made her more furious, thus setting the mood, so to speak, for their imminent courtship. A cherub of his alignment is seemingly motivated by little other than to conquer and destroy. From a bioexistential perspective, 
They behave somewhat like viruses, attacking the system from within. But as with all symbiotic organisms living within a universe, there are balancing factors. While those inhibiting a good, an evil cherub's territory will regard it as an unpredictable tyrant, those in the territory of a good cherub will likely come to view it as a protector, waiting quietly for millennia in deep space, waiting to attack any encroaching threat. In that sense, they are not unlike cells in a universal immune system. This balance of forces allows stability, such that life and new civilizations can blossom and thrive within a universe, thus assuring the possibility of its own elaborate procreation, or procreation process. The fuck? But if that balance was ever disturbed, it would lead to chaos in that biosystem. The universe could not survive for long, and if by some means a cherub with such destructive tendencies were to achieve unprecedented power, the resulting imbalance would be catastrophic for paradox space itself. And though the heroine of our story could have no way of knowing, this is what it would exactly this is exactly what would result result from the pursuit of her kismesis. My mouth is so goddamn dry. Mm. Uh, excuse me. Like humans, cherubs perceive romance through only one quadrant. Unlike humans, their relationships are exclusively black. But their mating ritual is much more violent than any practice trolls would, or even physically could engage in. And though it is critical to the perpetuation of their race, the confrontations can sometimes be lethal to one or both cherubs. Regardless of the outcome, the stakes are high. The winner of the duel will assume control of the other's territory, while the loser will slink away to bear the offspring. So as, she's, as she toured the planetary wreckage, she knew her quest for a mate was not just about the propagation of her species, but the, the liberation of billions from a monster. She pursued him for many sweeps with mounting obsession until one day the trail came to an end at a black hole. Cherubs typically seek out black holes as the setting for their mating ritual, but not any black hole. Once long ago, it was a star, and circling that star was a planet. That planet was home to one of the presently sparring cherubs. The male in this case returned to the site of his hatching to mate. A location now suspiciously occupied by a true massive black hole. This is where she found him, and this is where they would duel. While an adult cherub is a fearsome creature, and would be a formidable opponent to anyone in its unaltered state, this is not the form in which they do battle with each other. The ritual is more extreme and physically demanding than any other kind of courtship or duel in the universe. The moment they meet, they will both undergo a dramatic metamorphosis. The mates will then duel as two vast frightening serpents, each has each an astronomical unit in length. The tangled struggle between the green the green all ooze fuck. Yep, between the Green Atlantic University sports. No, but uh, yeah, whatever. Ooze, oh, O's is exceedingly brutal and can last for sweeps. While dueling in such a monstrous form, their energy is inexhaustible. The transformation taps into the cherub's latent connection with the enigmatic forces presiding over all that is eternal and a promete permeating all those endowed with immortality. Normally, this power is only accessible to them during mating. In this form, they are able to be injured by one another and are otherwise indestructible, or they are only able to be injured by one another and are otherwise indestructible. 
Hence, the ritual can never be stopped by an outside force until it is complete. It should come as no surprise that in this story our heroine was victorious. Upon defeating her mate, she initiated the interlocking formation to complete complete the coupling while assuming the dominant position, a stance undetectable to all but the most astute observers of the zoologically dubious. Consequently, the male was fertilized with the young. He then slithered away in disgrace from the territory he had just lost. A cherub looking to nest will search for a dead planet situated near a massive dying star. The egg is deposited on the planet's surface, and the rising temperature from the expanding red giant will incubate the egg until it is ready to hatch. Later in life, the cherub will grow wings, assuming it has matured properly, and if it has learned to fly well enough to reach a safe distance from the nest before the star goes supernova, soon the hungry, the hungry cherub will return and feast on the resulting stellar energy. Doing so allows it to gain enough strength to gra travel great distances and claim its own territory. The star will then collapse into a black hole, serving as a distant gravitational beacon to the cherub later in life so it may return there to mate. As it happens, our heroine's mate discovered Earth. Long after it had, been, it had journeyed to a new sun, and long since new civilizations had risen and fallen. But on the brink of destruction, now on the brink of destruction from its dying star, the barren accommodations were ideal for a young cherub. There he deposited his single egg and flew away, never to return. No cherub ever spawns more than one offspring at a time, and for it is, des for it is every cherub's destiny to grow up alone, or alone on the outside at least. From that egg hatched one very special cherub with two names, one that few will ever know, and one that few will ever say. The fascinating thing about cherub reproduction is how the parent's alignment is passed on to the young. If the male lays the egg, the alignments of the child, two halves will be the same as the parent. If the female lays the egg, the alignments will be flipped and the young male and female halves will be endowed with the opposite alignments of their parents. As such, the male half took after his father. Perhaps the son even exceeded him in violent tendencies. It is hard to imagine there has ever been a cherub more willfully destructive or as stubbornly dedicated to conquest than the monstrosity he would grow up to become. Due to his indomitable nature, I believe victory over his sister was a foregone conclusion. Barring a highly improbable glitch in causality, it would be almost impossible for her to predominate over someone like him. And even so, he didn't have the patience to wait. Unfortunately for everyone ever to exist, he discovered a way to predominate early. Yet it was not this act alone that would prove ominous, so much as the means through which it was achieved. He was allowed to become the solo player of a game which his kind was never meant to play. And so, it is with the predomination of her son that our heroine's story ends, and the story of our villain begins. Hey, Mina, where are you going? I'm taking a gaper break. God, but the story isn't over yet. Girl, your stories never end. My bladder can't even deal. Just keep talking while I'm gone. No, that's okay. We can wait. I already heard the damn story, though. Not all of it. Glibber, fuck. Can't you just keep yapping about snake sex while I hit the little grubs room already? Oh, wait. What did I do? Oh, there we go. I'm afraid not. Everyone must listen to the full story. Oh, my fucking God. You really are turning evil, aren't you? I'd be proud except for how terrible and boring the actual consequences are for me personally. Wait, does that mean you're a ghost? When you're a ghost, you still have to pee? 
None of your business, blue kid. That's so weird. Am I the only one who thinks that's weird? No, John. It's definitely pretty weird that ghosts have to pee. You get used to life as a ghost pretty fast, though. But weren't you already pretty used to peeing when you were alive? Yeah, that's why you get pretty used to it pretty fast, dummy. This is kind of a stupid conversation. Can we hear more about the snakes and whatnot? It was a pretty cool story. Yes, as soon as Mina returns from her visit to the Load Gaper. Holy mackerel, you shit fucks. Just enjoy your space lizard point while I take a fucking piss. I think we could all stand to take a brief intermission from the story regardless. Let all these intriguing facts about Cherub sink in. Ugh, you and your intermissions. What is it with your intermissions? They ain't even intermissions most of the time. They're just a dumb excuse to tell another dumb story inside a longer dumb story. Yes, Mina, you are correct. Your reservations are noted. However, would it change your mind if I were to propose not an intermission, but a interfission? <laughs> Fine, let's do the interfission thing you said, because of fish. BRB, you scrubs. Begin interfission. I, uh, aren't I, aren't I, is this not flash enabled? What is this shit? Oh boy, this is the whole reason we use Firefox. A moment, please. We're going to solve this real quick. Why is Flash not working? Do I have to actually go and install Flash on this manually? God damn it. We gotta reinstall Flash. Who, who, it's been so long since I've needed to do that. I remember in high school, that was the entire reason why I installed Google Chrome. Because on the normal computer, uh, or on this, what do you call it? You didn't have permissions to install Flash on the computer. But if you installed Google Chrome, it came with Flash installed, so it wasn't even a problem. Allow, just like, no, notify me. That's how we roll. That's what Flash is for. Updating Flash. The second time I've done that. Fresh now or nope I gotta Alright we're gonna I'm gonna write back for a moment. We're gonna close this and then hopefully uh, you know what? Let's just hide that for a moment so we don't get blindsided by my search history. And then once we have this solved we can Go it again. Hooray, it's fixed. Great. Please work properly. Yep, okay. No one has been. Alright, begin fishing. It's at this moment he realizes there's no sound. I patch guy fell the fuck down. What are we doing here? I see. Okay, thanks. Bye. Okay, well, end of interfishing. That was intriguing. We installed Flash. We all learned a lot. Anyway, where was I? Oh wait, you know what? This is a great place to just stop. I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually use this intermission. I'm just gonna stop, and we'll be back uh, next time on Tatsuki Reads Homestuck. But for now, yeah.
Yeah, I'm gonna stop because it's it's been longer than this hour that I'm seeing on my OBS because I forgot that I was doing a other part first. And yeah. Anywho. Yeah, we're gonna try and finish this at some point. <laughs>